Carissima Tiziana, alla fine del suo fellowship Tiziana Dina ci onorerà con un discorso interessantissimo. Lei durante il suo soggiorno ci ha illuminati tante volte e ci ha avvicinati alla filosofia italiana. Benvenuta Tiziana, sono curioso di apprendere nuove cose sul rapporto tra arte e legge. Only philosophers dare argue about the concept of art. So the rest of the world thinks that's a very clear. And yet the respective or a uh, problem that nobody could ever bring a solution to. And yet the respective understanding of what constitutes art has real legal consequences, be it in art and copyright law or when determining the scope of constitutional protection of artistic freedom. The relationship between law and the art is, however, often characterized by, by conflicts. And this not only goes for contemporary art, Uh, I was so lucky to talk yesterday to I uh, Vive in London, and this is a person who really embodies this conflict. Philosopher Professor Dr. Tiziana Andina from Turin has been working on this difficult relationship during her fellowship at the center and has paid particular attention to differences between contemporary and, to put it in a kind of simplified manner, traditional art. Does the nature of conceptual art that is increasingly charged with meaning lead to a new concept of art? And what role is played by the attempt to utilize the règle de l'art in the sense of proprietary normativity of the aesthetic sphere for the purposes of the definitional problem. Tiziana Andina will delve into these issues today in her lecture, Embodied Meanings and Normativity, for a new concept of art, which will be illustrated with numerous examples offering considerable philosophical insights. In general, I know that you use also elements and exemplars of art in order to verify this is the way you do your wonderful conferences. Tiziana Andina studied philosophy, what else? At the University of Turin, is that right really? You started at Turin, no? Yeah. In, uh, some years later, she received her PhD with a thesis entitled Friedrich Nietzsche e l'estetica della percezione indiretta. Friedrich Nietzsche uh, and the aesthetics of the indirect perception to give uh, translation as correct as possible. At the University of Palo Amo, you come from, you are a Sicilian mm -hmm. girl, yes, yeah. really? So take care. There are always brothers around, always. I know it by experience. Since 2015, she is associated professor at the Department for Philosophy uh, of the University of Torino. Professor Andina was a visiting scholar, and this is a re really very impressive list, at Columbia University, and a visiting professor and scholar at St. Petersburg State University of Information Technologies, Mechanics and Optics, yeah. ITMO, in 2014. <coughs> and she will be at the end of October, if I see right, for a future project also in uh, the same place and perhaps in a project that might also be interesting for us if I understood correctly your invitation to join you. It would be an honor for us. Her research interests focus on the fields of theoretical philosophy, philosophy of art, as well as on ontology and aesthetics. Since March 2015, um, um, uh, and still some days, you are a fellow before being transferred into the status, in the post-fellow yeah. status. <laughs> and if this uh, center will reach uh, the status of being a permanent institution, 
of eternity, then I'm very sure that you will become a permanent fellow also. Art as embodied meaning, what does it mean? According to rules, what rules of art and what kind of normativity, what type of, as we say in German, Geltungsanspruch claims the body of meaning. Adesso tocca a te, a te di darci le, le risposte, le risposte, perché, perché sono capace di farmi comprendere in italiano. Yes. Scusate. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I want to take the advantage of uh, of this talk to really thanks Werner Gepard, Professor Gepard, to to give me the opportunity to stay and uh, to be here uh, for uh, a short part of my life. This is this is really. A, an amazing place uh, uh, which gave me the opportunity to take a uh, free time, a great conversation with an amazing group of fellows. So uh, it was a, a really an inspiring period to stay and to be here. So thank you very much, Bernard, for this opportunity. Um, I would like today to talk to you about, uh, as, as Werner told very well, uh, about the, possi the possibility to give a new definition of, uh, uh, of the concept of art. And my talk will uh, ideally uh, start from the point uh, uh, on which Gianmaria uh, Ayani stopped his own definition uh, a couple of, uh, of months ago. Um, the aim of this talk uh, a subject on which I have been working for a while now is to close the gap between contemporary and so to speak traditional art. This gap is produced due to the lack of comprehension, at least in my opinion, that both the expert and common sense have a so, have a so called contemporary art. Um, no, this one. I, I would like to begin by referring to the talk given by Gianmaria Yani here at KAK a couple of months ago. Some of, of you were, were here. Gianmaria showed in a very accurate way what are the problems to be faced by the scholar who are dealing in jurisprudence with works of art, especially the contemporary ones. These problems are not raised just from the perspective of scholarship. In fact, our common sense has also been asked to change its standard view on art. Let me explain what I mean by telling you a short piece of popular uh, cartoon series. <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, most of you know the series, obviously. The Simpsons. Um, it's possible to, to go over the, the, the web and to, to see uh, over, the, over the cartoon. Uh, season number 10, episode uh, 19. In this episode, Homer Simpson, Simpson, the protagonist of the series, is trying to make a do uh, why I barbecue. Um, after many misadventures that frustrate his ambition of making a nice barbecue, Omar tries to return to who thinks to the store. As uh, he is driving, a car accident caused to fall, caused to load to fall into the road, and Homer decides to run away without worrying about it. The next day, a young woman who is an art dealer visit Omar, Tom, asking him for the permission to organize an exhibition with his work. Without a doubt, it's a work of art. We will not follow Homer in his personal experience in understanding what it means to be an artist and creating a work of art. Uh, here we, want, we, we just want to underline the experience of a common sense view about contemporary art. Such view is well expressed by Merji, 
Homer's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Almost at the end of the story. To be an artist was Merge's dreams. To realize this dream, she attended very good uh, schools and practiced a lot. Uh, and uh, now Homer, without having done anything, <laughs> is defined a great artist. This makes no sense. Homer's answer is also inspired by common sense. This is a key, a key point. In his view, to be an artist means to be able to realize well-made artworks, which represent reality in a clear way. In a world, emerges works, uh, emerges works of art, things look like they are in reality. They are a reproduction of reality. So that is uh, a mimesis in a technical uh, uh, philosophical language. An important legitimation to this intuition comes from Plato's uh, The Republic, as you probably know, uh, especially book number 10. Drawing his metaphysics of the universe, Plato classified works of art as copies of things which are themselves copies of ideas. Comparing the perfection of the ideal reality of ideas, the reality of the material world is less perfect. This is uh, the metaphysical overview uh, of Plato taught. At the lowest, the lowest level of perfection, therefore, we find works of art. At the end of the day, they are copies of a real thing that are in turn copies of idea. Um, it is not my aim to discuss this point in order to distinguish, for example, the rule play by philosophy from that play by common sense within the disputes on the real nature of art. My aim is different, indeed, and rather focuses on those cases in which the Platonic framework seems not to work, in particular over the 20th century. A point that was certainly discovered by Plato and that is independent of any particular cultural mindset is that in order to state something about art, it is necessary to state something about the relationship between art and reality. In Plato's view, this relation consists in copying, not just mirroring, parts of reality creating some objects which become in turn part of reality. The arts of 19 show us basically two things. The first one is that the Platonic way is not right, the right one to understand art. And the second one is that despite this mistake, the Platonic intuition is correct. To understand the very nature of art, it is necessary to look deeply into, into the relationship between art and reality. Indeed, it is this relation that has been investigated by contemporary art and especially by the avant-garde. Now, how was this investigation carried out, carry out in the 19th century? My sense. My sense is that artists either introduce a new confusion inside our taxonomies or <laughs> unveil some mistakes that were already present at them. Do you remember some of the examples discussed by Ayani? I'm, go I'm going to recall quickly some of them briefly. Uh, has all the cases raised by customs officials make this lack in our taxonomies particularly evident. We can cite at least three different situations in three different moments in time and three different places in the world. Imagine the scene. It was 19, 1926 at the custom of the United States. Bird in Space, that's the, the title of the works of art, um, a sculpture by Constantine Branchusi, arrived to New York by sea. Upon inspecting it, custom officials challenged the idea that the strange object was a sculpture, seeing as it in no way resembled a bird. 
For this reason, they refused to categorize Branchus's creation as a work of art, preferring to consider it a kitchen a utensil. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's true. They therefore applied to it the taxation that was normally reserved for merchandise, while works of art were subject to a f fiscal uh, uh, exemption. As expected, Branchusi was outraged and the matter was brought to federal courts. Thus began one of the most notorious trials in the history of art, Branchusi versus United States. <coughs> Edward Steichen, the photographer who had bought the sculpture, uh, explained the affair to Gertrude Whitney, founder of the Whitney Museum of uh, uh, New York, who upon realizing that the case would become a formidable juridical precedent, offered to cover the legal fees of the trio. Six members of the jury redundant in, Brancusi, in Branchusi's favor, Edward Steichen, sculptor Jacob Epstein, the editor of the Journal of Arts, the editor of Vanity Fair, the, di the director of the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and the art critic, uh, Eric McBride. Um, Marcus Igebonten represents customs. The US government had two jurors as well, sculptor Robert Eichen and Thomas Jones. The states defended the custom officials, recalling a prior case, United States versus Olivotti, from 1916, in which the only artifact that qualified as work of art were those that were recognized, that's, that's why I cited, I mentioned Plato and mimetic theory before, uh, recognized as imitation of objects in nature. Remember this point, please. Um, the following are a few lines from the debate. From the debate. <clears throat> Jude White asked Tyson, what do you call this? That Tyson respond, I call it what the sculptor call it, Uze, which means bird. White continues, how can you say that he is a bird if it does not resemble one? Tyson, I'm not saying that he is a bird. I'm saying that it looks like a bird. To me, just that it was stylized and named by the artist. White replies, and the only reason for which you say it is a bird is because the artist called it one? Tyson, yes, your honor. White persists, if you had seen it on the road, would you have called it a bird? <laughs> If you had seen it in the forest, would you have shot at it? Station, no, your are <laughs> The trial came to, to a close on 26 November 1928 with the acknowledgement that Branchus's work, Bird in Space, was in fact a work of art. In this case, we have an artifact, a sculpture, which does not resemble an object that custom of features are able to identify clearly. The object, which has no clear identity, brings some confusion into the taxonomy of the officials who consider the artwork as a mere material objects. Knives have a similar shape, perhaps usually. Now, we move to a different place in a different uh, location. Um, the problem is similar, but it's not uh, exactly the same. Uh, Brillo box by the great artist Andy Warhols uh, are exhibited in, a, uh, in 1964 at the Stable Gallery, very famous gallery in New York. Disembarked in uh, Canada in 1965 in the care of art merchant Gerald Morris custom officials, yet again classified them as a products, specifically boxes from a grocery store, and applied to them the corresponding taxation. <laughs> Their confusion, confusion in reality was um, uh, understandable. Grocery stores were full of Brillo boxes. Uh, they are still uh, right now of Brillo boxes. 
containing spawns and cleaning pots and pans. And pans. An expert was therefore consulted, Mr. Charles Comfort, director of National Gallery of Canada, who, having seen Warlow's works in photographs, supported the opinion of customs officials. Brillo Box was uh, not a work of art. The chain is uh, only apparently in the same. This time, indeed, the resemblance, the mimating relationship within uh, the artwork and the material objects is not in question. The Brillo boxes are too similar to Brillo box in grocery store to be a work of art. In the Brillo boxes case, the custom official followed a line of reasoning that is uh, contrary to that used in the case of Branchusi's sculpture. Branchusi's sculpture, in fact, did not resemble the part of reality it was named after. Here, the question is quite the, oppos the opposite. Are the Brillo box made by Handy World too similar to the ordinary objects drawn by James Harvard? There is a long story between <laughs> That I, I, that I would like to, uh, to tell you, but we have no time uh, comparing the difference between the ordinary ob objects, Brillo box, which was drawn by another artist, and the copies one uh, drawn by Andy Warhol. <laughs> that is an, another interesting case, but uh, we, don't, uh, we don't go in it uh, right now. Anyway. Um, are the Brillo boxes made by Andy Warhol too similar to the ordinary objects drawn by James Harvey, Harvey an artist and a quite well-known designer, to be a work of art? That's the second question. As we know, common sense is generally very sensitive to this idea. Our naive taxonomies make a distinction between class of work of art and the class of material objects. How it is possible, this is the implicit question po posed by inspectors, that something resembling, resembling so closely a very common object could be a work of art. At the end of the day, we know that, uh, as Walter Benjamin said, works of art must show at least some properties that, that they don't share with ordinary objects. An artwork must be original, not reproducible and unique. The Brillo boxes by Andy Warhol were produced in series in a huge number of exemplars inspired by, it, not to say copied from, ordinary boxes. So what has to be said about our ontological distinction between the class of works of, of artworks and the class of ordinary objects? If, as it seems, there are some artworks which are identified by the same properties as ordinary objects. Let me make another uh, example, the final one, showing, showing another problem with our taxonomies. This time it is the work uh, uh, Icons, that's the name of uh, the title of the, of the works, that is, passing, that is passing through European customs. These are works made with fluorescent lights, lights symbolize the icons of our time, and Dan Flavin, the American artist, exhibited them in some of the most prestigious museums in the world. Nevertheless, as, as was described by The Guardian, custom official in the European <coughs> community determined that Flavin's works were light fixtures and accordingly they had to be subject to the corresponding tool, meaning no offense to the art world. The art gallery, on the contrary, declared them to be works of art, asking that they be subjected to a value add tax of 5%, as stated in chapter uh, 197 of the British Common Customs Tariff. After having interpreted the tariff table and having identified no correspondence between the important objects and the category feature on the list, British Customs authorities refused to allow their objects to be classified as work of art. 
both objects were subject to what was then the standard rate of 70.5% and to customs fee of 3.7%. Following the gallery opposition, the London Court states that the objects are work of art and confirm the applicability of the request task breaks. The conclusion of uh, this incident is uh, uh, not worthy. A few UN member countries whose custom of offices had dealt with some similar case brought the case to the European Commission that on August 11, uh, 2010 issued a regulation in which it is states that the sculptors by Dan Flavin cannot be cannot cannot be classified as art, but rather as wall-like fittings. As you may not, as you may not, this case is very similar to uh, Brillo Box case. The custom officer considered the fluorescent light to be ordinary objects. This is why their and our taxonomies do not, do, do not allow the possibility that an ordinary object could be also a work of art without it having any visible property. I hope that now the framework is quite clear. During the 20th century, most of the artistic production was thought to mass up the chapter division between ordinary objects and works of art. What was the aim of this? In philosophical jargon, we call an operation of uh, this kind a meta-reflection on the meaning and extension of the concept, for example, art, targeted to reconfiguring the idea or uh, even a definition of the concept. The artist evidently wanted to question the traditional view. For them, the relationship between art and reality is not a relation between a model, a reality, and a copy, a work of art. Certainly, works of art are part of reality, but not in the same, ways, in the same way as, we may say, the mirror image of Mona Lisa. The relation between art and reality is the core of the definition of the art that was questioned throughout uh, the 20th century. Within this context, it would have been very odd if philosophy had not attempted to respond to a problem posed by both the art world and the whole of society. Now, before starting with my argument for a new definition of art, I would like to address a couple of methodological points. Um, the, the first one concerns some expression I will use in my argument. I will adopt a basic, a very basic ontology, composed by three different classes of things natural objects, artifacts, and ideological objects. By artifacts, I mean all those objects that are entirely created or partially modified by an intentional activity. I will adopt a wide conception of normativity. I will claim that normativity corresponds to the awareness that something can be correct or incorrect, but also that uh, certain judgment can be better than others. Finally, a few words about my general perspective in philosophy of art. In my idea, it is not a concern of philosophy to establish what is art and what is not. What object is an artwork and what is not? In other words, it is not a task of philosophy to prescribe a normative position that is a set of rules in order to distinguish what is art from what isn't. Instead, philosophy might do a good job in showing good arguments to explain the current state of affairs in the art world. In other words, I prefer a descriptive metaphysics to a prescriptive one. 
My view, therefore, is in the file of the descriptive metaphysic, and my goal is that of drawing a broad definition of the notion of art, including all types of artworks that have asked for a revision of our art taxonomies, mainly through a reconsideration of the relation between art and reality. So, now I would like to present the definition of art on which I have been working, along, along with the, uh, some reason to explain why the normativity uh, plays a central role in drawing a much more functional definition. My definition is the following. A work of art is a social and historical object, an artifact, which embodies a representation in the form of inscribed trace upon a medium that is not transparent. All three conditions are jointly necessary, and my idea is that condition two and three meet both in sphere of normativity. Let us start with the first condition. A work of art is a social and historical object. The first, con the first condition puts forward two ideas. Uh, for an artwork to exist, a social system and an artwork are jointly necessary. What does this mean? Basically, that artworks are artifacts, namely products of human intentionality, which are made in a certain time by people who aim saying something to someone else. The relevant point at this stage is this, a further element seems to be necessary in addition to the existence of a social system. <coughs> this element is the art world, which in my perspective is necessary to include contemporary art in the definition of art. But what is the art world and why do I suppose it is necessary to include it to draw a new broader definition? The art world is a vague concept that because uh, of its very vagueness can help us better understand the idea that a social context is necessary for artwork to exist. I will adopt the definition sketched by the American philosopher George Dickey to describe the art world. I'm quoting. What is the art world? This is the answer by G, drawn by, by Dickey. The core personnel of the art world is a loosely organized but nevertheless related set of person including artists understood to refer to painters, writers, composers, producers, museum directors, museum goers, theater goers, reporters for newspaper, critics for publication of all sorts, art historian, historians, art theorists, philosophers of art, and others. These are the people who keep the, machi the machin machinery of the art world working and thereby provide for its uh, continuing existence. American philosopher and art critic Arthur Danto used the concept of art world for the first time in 1974 paper. His aim was to underline that an art world is made up not only by formal properties, but also by other properties, some, dependent, some depending on the, cul on the cultural and historical context, other depending on the narrative of the history of art. Both groups of properties meet the intellect, not the sense, the senses. Danto never formulated an institutional theory of art. That is, he never intended to say that what is art merely depends on the cultural context. He intended to say that there are several factors which now, nowadays are certainly of increasing relevance that constitute the inner nature of the work of art and that the comprehension of this factor is as important as the comprehension of the so-called called formal or aesthetic qualities. 
Elsewhere, I have defined the art world uh, as a quasi-institutional entity. The art world resembles an informal institution, that is to say a social practice or organization, that functions thanks to ingenuous and uh, unwritten rules. The action performed by uh, such quasi-institutions are of a different time type compared to those performed by institutional entities. Action performed by institutional entities take place in an endless amount of cases, marriage, university degrees, for example, certification exam, professional practice, the stipulation of a contract, and so on and so forth. In each of these examples, a particular institution, the church, the state, a professional association, etc., has the power to transform an action or even an object into something else by attributing to it a particular function. Think of when uh, um, a wall become a political border, for example, or when the I do of a bride turns into a legally valid promise. The fact that we have an ingenuous and uh, uh, the most part vague concept of the art world at our disposal still legitimizes our supposing that it is essentially something, or in other words, a certain type of entity. It is in, in this fact an entity that emerges from and therefore is bound to be de dependent on the elements that form it. The artwork exists because, because museum, artists, artwork, consumer, and art market exist. The institution of the art world is founded upon the union and the integration of all of these elements. In certain cases, the relations seem to be, be directional. Artists, like Duchamp, exist precisely because an art world exists. And works of art, such as, uh, for example, Battle Rock, exist because museums and collections, such as Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, exist. Moreover, museums and foundations have been allowed to do what they do by the art world itself, even though the contrary also holds true. The Rauschenberg Foundation exists because uh, works like Duchamp's exist and must be conserved and passed on. In general, art theories refer to two different types of uh, institution. Following, following uh, the American philosopher Jeffrey Wynand classif classification, uh, we, can, we can name this in, uh, institution I institution and P institution. S stands for action and P for person. An I institution is one that produces action whose tokens are instantiations uh, of particular kind of action. This kind of institution distinguish themselves from others because they produce action that are governed by rules. Two people to wish to be joined in marriage can only do so within an institution where certain rules have been um, accepted and sanctioned. In other words, an I institution produces a, produce a sort of uh, conventional act. P institutions, conversely, are understood as quasi-person or agents. They perform action and can be called upon to account for them. In general, P institutions act through members who operate by themselves. Examples might include state officials, the bishop of a church, or the managing director, for example, of a company. A state might celebrate, say, marriage through its official and therefore can perform an institutional act. In short, the distinction between an institution and P institution mark a distinction between institution as acts or type of acts and institution as agents. 
Whereas in Dick's theory, the art world is made by both type of institution which play a role in, trans in transfiguring a material object into a work of art, I think that art world in many cases provides some instruments to the artist in order to complete his creation uh, and to the public in order to perform a better comprehension of the artworks. In both cases, the artwork is indeed an instrument to better perform uh, the creation or the interpretation. But, and this point is uh, really important, it is not the real maker of works of art. Thus, thus far for the first condition. Now let <coughs> us come to the other two conditions. A work of art is a will show you. The first part, a work of art is a social and historical object. Now, uh, to come to the second condition, an artifact which embodies a representation in the form of an, inscri an inscribed trace, and finally, the third condition, upon a medium that is not transparent. The second condition refers, uh, refers uh, to two elements. The first one is the artifactuality. Works of art are artifacts, that is material objects created or alterated through an intentional action performed by human beings. The relationship between artifact and reality is not, as in platonic metaphysics, a mimetic one. However, it is centered upon a representation, something that lies at the core of human life. While it is true that perception and representation are both at the core of our experience of the world, it is also true that the artistic representation is structured in a particular way, compared to the non-artistic one. The most important characteristic of the artistic representation are two. To work properly, an artistic representation doesn't need to necessarily be realistic, nor does it to have to grasp the reality as it is. However, the artistic representation, the picture, the picture as it is called in a philosophical language, has to embody the artistic route to you. Work of art, along with our belief, carry representation that are intentional. This means that while in epistemic activities we are dealing with the truth, in depiction artists have no obligation to deal with the truth. We do not need to carry out any sort of inquiry into the real world to understand Don Quixote to go to the text and follow the plot is enough, as well as convenience. Certainly, if we were to possess subsidiary knowledge of the life of knights errants, our understanding of the novel would improve, but we would not have so much as an additional ounce of knowledge. Words do not say anything about the world if not, if not incidentally, and as it often said, accidentally. In other words, a tourist is not likely, is not likely to choose to walk the street of Manhattan by relying on Shovel's novel Where New York Ends, instead of a lonely planner travel guide. The novel could perhaps be extremely accurate in its representation of the city, but whether it's truly is so is a question that concerns the author, the author choice. It is for this reason that we can understand an imaging, let's say a representation of the Sphinx, without having to ask ourselves if a lion with a human head really exists in an Egyptian desert. In general, then, we understand an image that is to say we classify 
it uh, in a proper way or we identify its uh, representational content without knowing if what it depicts actually exists. We understand its meaning and this is enough. The third condition is about the way in which a depiction can be embodied, embodied in a medium. This marks the singularity of each work of art and determines the artistic quality. My sense is that this third condition needs to be further investigated if you want to better explain the definition. Differently from all forms of scientific knowledge which are used to embody representation in structured and articulated concepts, work of art embody raw ideas, not only use, using words, but also several other media. And in those cases in which words are used, we have to remember that they, that they embody intentional representation. In any case, the intentional representation embodied, in, the intentional representation embodied is structured in such a way that work of art usually saves something on a double level. The artist says something about something, the first level, through the representation, and the medium, which is composed by representation plus the physical qualities of the objects, say something about the world. This is a specific culture, a particular historical era, and so on. Let me try to explain by referring to some examples. A cross is an age of the semantic objects with an history that predates its use throughout Christianity. Um, if we consider its modern day meanings, those which are able to decipher without the help of reading guides, the following come to mind, the death of Jesus, the presence of a church, a hospital, a cemetery or a tomb, a pharmacy, a street intersection, or a dead end street. The matter is quite simple, it can be formulated in these in this terms. For what reason is the first th that cross, which is the signal, is not a work of art, while this one and this other one are both work of art. The cross in, the f in these slides represent a dead end on a street sign, while these other two depict two works by imaginative and polyvalent French artist Clet Abram. In his cross, the artist evidently embodies a new meaning. In Abram's works, the road seen uh, in the shape of cross become a real cross. Here's the first image in which displays uh, this one, this one, which displays a stylized body hanging from a pool with uh, no way out, just as the dead and street depicted on the street sign. And uh, the second image, this one, which sits, which quotes the most classic and widely known deposition from the cross. What is the difference between these and normal <coughs> signs that also have a representative content? This is the central point. Both type of image have a representative content, but it's supposed to be a difference between the artistic one and the non-artistic one. Abram's representation are uh, contained container in a medium that is a canvas which says something about the idea of uh, sacredness in the postmodern era hanging on walls and uh, uh, and found along the street of Florence the sign are locked at because because of what they are and not because of the classic meaning that they embody 
the warning, this is the classic meaning, obviously, the warning of a death and street. Abram, <coughs> Abram Sinyan, along with many other works in contemporary art, is particularly rich, as it presents a stratified plurality of meanings. There are the meanings exemplified by the street sign and those implemented by the artist. Both meanings um, are greatly singular. The cross is a dead and the road. A man who has been crucified, who is taken down from a cross and lies in the arms of a, of a grieving mother, like this one, represent the expression of that which is, in the most definitive way, death. There is no trace of transcendence in the representation of a man hanging from a cross depicted on a street sign, nor is there in its exposition to the, dis to the distracted passers by. Yet it is not a sacred place that conserves and protects the power of death symbols. This fact, in particular, make it clear how the medium not only embody the depiction by the artist, but also plays a central role in doing this in a way that says something about the culture in which Abram works. A culture in which art is made popular and accessible through the popular use uh, of its icons, for example, including religious ones. These icons are not used to offer a figurative narration to the story of the Christianity. Rather, this narration is reconfigured to say something about the era in which such reconfiguration takes place. In the open work, Umberto Eco says something similar, where he says that works of art give us picture of a reality that old as epistemological metaphors. Eco rightly notes that works of art possess a, a double semantics. In fact, they are epistemic metaphor, which means that they say something about something through representation, and that they say something through the structure of their body, the medium. That's the quotation from the open work. Art as structuring of forms, as its own ways of talking about the world and man. It may happen that a work of art makes statements about the world towards its topic, as in the subjects of a novel or in a poem. But first of all, as forms, art makes statements about how it is structured, showing the historical and personal trends that have led to, to it and that implicit worldview manifest, manifested by a certain form. Now, that all condition that make up my definition have, have been explained, I would like to come back to the question of normativity briefly. I mentioned that uh, ever since Duchamp introduced the ready-made in a museum, alongside the traditional works of art, the ontological question has become urgent. Stated differently, the important chesura determined by contemporary art, specifically by the Dada movement and abstract expressionism, seems to really question the idea that the access to understanding of art is given by sensibility. The whiteness of the urinal, the properties of a color white, was certainly not the reason that prompted Duchamp to present a, a urinal built in a series at an art competition. As the, art himself, uh, the artist himself explained, he didn't expect the audience to appreciate the aesthetic qualities of Fontaine, quite the contrary. If anything, the opposite was true. Duchamp was uh, interested in, in the anesthetic dim dimensions, since his goal was to create, create a work of art prescinding from the use of traditional aesthetic properties. First of all, beauty. 
the pursuit of uh, anestheticness is what distinguishes ready made from abstractism, in which, think for example, to works of Malevich, color is still a determinant element. In other words, Malevich and abstract paintings are surely closer to figurative painting, paintings than Fountain and other ready made in fact, for the latter, it does not seem possible to appeal to any judgment of test, and consequently, there seems to be no aesthetic normativity to which to refer. The hypothesis that I intend to verify at this stage is that the issue of normativity in contemporary art is subject to a revision of definition of the very concept of art. The key point in the case of the judgment of test is the question of its universality and therefore its normativity. For a long time, aesthetic normativity had, uh, has had uh, as its pre prerequisite the idea of beauty. As stated by Immanuel Kant, we expect that anyone who has seen or will see the Mona Lisa, for example, can only find it beautiful and therefore can only express the exact same judgment. It therefore seems that there is a tension between the idea of judgment, of taste, for example, judgment that generally relates to matters subject to taste are subjective, and the idea <coughs> that they aspire to, to achieve broad, even universal consensus. In other words, they seem to be both subjective, individual, and objective, normative. So the judgment of test claims to be normative, to establish itself as a rule that applies to everyone, not just the one who formulates it. However, since artists freed themselves from beauty, the bond between art and the universality of judgment of test has become problematic. In the reshaping of the concept of art that I'm sketching here, the trace of meaning and the body of the artwork are fundamental, while the aesthetic properties of medium are secondary. In other words, the work my the artwork my may or may not be beautiful, whatever this means. Therefore, it may or may not exhibit ecstatic properties, but the latter are not necessary condition for its identity. It follows, it seems that follows, that there is no normativity of the judgment of test that can be applied to contemporary art. Let me make uh, another observation from the point of view of the history of concept. One of the most successful readings uh, of all events and self-transformation that art has imposed on itself in the 20th century is the one formulated by Arthur Danto on the basis of what uh, had already been somehow intuited by Hegel in the Phenomenology of Spirits where he saw that art's fate was to be resolved in the philosophy. In the end of art, Danto argues that avant-garde, which pursue art to reverse, to reverse the limits of its own, its, its own definition, brought it to reach the extreme limits of its possibility, or rather of its own development. That's why the art won't have a progressive development such as one, the one reconstructed by Vasari, but will rather uh, be the expression of singular, uh, single individuals. The history of art as a history of progress perhaps has to come to an end, at least according to what we can see from the historical perspective in which we find ourselves. What must be noted is that uh, through the 20th century, art has lost its possibility to call for the universality of the judgment of test 
as well as historical and progressive development. Danto suggests not to look at these laws you said, with nostalgia. After all, the counterpart of all this is a great gain that is the most absolute liberty that artists have won, breaking the canons, cultural tradition, and finally frying, frying, frying themselves from demand on their patrons. Our post-historical dimension allows us to draw a conclusion as to the issues of normativity. From our historical perspective, we know that normativi normativity of the judgment of test is not about art. And on the other hand, we have also reached a, a more meaningful understanding of the concept of art. We know that visual arts in their various forms belong to the domain of sensible, sensible cognition, and we know that the trace of meaning is a uh, of great importance to a work of art, more than its aesthetic properties. In the contemporary art, therefore, it no longer makes sense to refer to the normativity of the aesthetic judgment, while in my sense is that certainly normativity exists for what concerns the ways in which the semantic trace is incorporated in an artwork. An artwork really works which means it is successful, in all those cases in which the significant trace is embodied in an appropriate ways so that the viewers can have some kind of cognitive response which can sometimes be also characterized in emotional terms. Let me reach the conclusion with an example. Ursula Bima, Biman is a Swiss artist who tried to render through her lens both the psychological and, and social dynamics of migration. For example, you may see a uh, work uh, of art named uh, Sahara Chronicle. And the, the, and the transgenerational effects of phenomena like the exploitation of natural resources and climate change. You can see deep weather for this case. Biman deals with video art and more precisely with what the artist defines video essays. To clarify this neologism, we might refer to the idea that art, all art, embodies meanings. Biman seems to be convinced that uh, convinced of this point of this to the point of comparing her production, video to a category that normally does not refer to art journals, but rather to scientific works, he says. Deep Weather is a video, is a video essay, which is different from a video story. The aim is not simply to record facts, but to offer a world view related <coughs> to these facts, which are recorded. This means that the artist is fully aware of the artistic scope of her work as well as of the artistic scope, they make the, the artistic one even more powerful. Another interesting element concerns the use of the emotional element, which is generally very present in art and which we would expect to be present even more significantly in works such, a, such as those by Biman, as they address issues with a high emotional impact. Yet the artist decides to make her work unemotional. If the mass media tend to underline the emotional aspect of these issues through a violent use of images, Beeman presents the problem in, in eminently critical terms. While the emotion is reduced to zero, the two video essays are strongly characterized in, a st in a aesthetic terms. They are certainly very beautiful, not only made using a sophisticated technique, but also endowed with a strong aesthetic element. I would like to show you just, okay. I wish I, I come to the conclusion. There is a, a double normativity in Biman videos essays. 
The first regards the structure of the medium, the second concerns the structure of the semantic trace embodied in the medium. The work doesn't speak to us at the emotional level. And the decrease between the narrated horror and the an emotional way in which it is narrated is so evident that it has to be outcome of a specific artistic choice. The combination of, this, of these two elements make it so that the semantic trace Beeman's works it grasps through an evident communicational short circuit. The tragedy is detached from emotion but just opposed to the weakness of the normative and theoretical framework of the Western culture. From this weakness derives a strongly ethical and political slot. After all, Beeman adds nothing to the chronicle of migration. She goes throughout it, follows closely, renders it accessible to the audience in short time. Nevertheless, there is only one way to respond to this artwork, as it demands both a universal and an individual response. We must question the foundation and meaning of, West, of Western values and uh, reconsider our idea of humanity. Thank you.